I love history and I was reading something recently uh, about Winston Churchill who when he became Prime Minister said to his private secretary, I just want you to know I've become a bit of a blubberer. And there was a journalist who actually tried to count how many times he teared up in public and gave up, it was that many. And I fear that uh, I've become a bit of a blubberer. Uh, my daughter will tell you, the one who was lost for words a few moments ago, not a common occurrence, um, that I, watching a sporting event, I can tear up. So I'm not planning it today. I'm possibly forewarning you. We're in a series uh, in, that we called We Will Remember. And I want to talk about remembering to lament or learning how to lament. In the book of Joel, there is our theme verse where God speaks over a nation that has been plundered and it's pictured as successive waves of locusts that have come and eaten everything, destroyed everything. And then comes this extraordinary promise, I will restore to you that which the locust has eaten, that which you have lost. And contained in the very promise that God gives is an acknowledgement from him that there is pain in your story, that you have a story, that things have happened, that there's moments where the sense of what you've lost for whatever reason and in whatever context just stirs in your heart. We talk a lot about pain and about our pain and the pain of others today. And mostly I think it's helpful. But I find myself as a news addict, addict that I've begun to shrink back from even watching the nightly news. As report after report comes of our broken, fallen humanity and this kind of almost tsunami of pain that is experienced by humans in God's world. It's not our world, it's His world. And I was reading something just this week, who, a health expert who said he believes that as this pandemic begins to wind down, not so it's showing signs of it at the moment in certain places, that the world is going to experience a tsunami of grief. And it was a person from a faith background and they were just saying, we've got to be real and I'm not prophesying that over you. I'm just saying globally there's stuff happening. In some countries, COVID-19 is now out of control. Um, and it's usually to be found in the poorest of nations where people can't even afford to lock down because if they don't go and do something, they will have no food on their table. They don't have the social security systems that we are so blessed with. And in these situations, the poor as always suffer beyond our experience, my experience, and indeed beyond at times I think even my own comprehension. And I have traveled, I have seen, I have witnessed that kind of poverty. And I include myself in that observation that I, I, I don't fully get, I've never lived it, but I'm aware of it. There are some extraordinary acts of wickedness being played out, and I'm not going to give a comprehensive list, but be too long. But acts of witness played out with guns, resulting in destructive bloodshed in the Tigray province of Ethiopia, where there is literally ethnic cleansing going on at the moment, and over 70,000 people executed. In Myanmar, we've seen it on our own screens. And I think the last count is over 700 dead, amongst them 36 children. I've got a news report from a friend of mine, a pastor who lives in Myanmar, up in the north, where a band of soldiers, they run an orphanage, have some 40-something kids they care for. These soldiers just late at night drove past, shot up the building. Fortunately, nobody was injured, but then Somebody driving past on a motorcycle was randomly shot and killed. Kind of 
my mind can't even fully get around all of that. And people's hopes and aspirations in these countries just for fundamental human rights and democratic freedoms are overlooked mainly even by us as we live in a far more settled democracy. And in parallel at times, we seem to be indifferent to the reality that our own democracy has been set on fire by sins past and sins present. And as those who are created in God's image, crowned with dignity and honor, the Bible says, we've all too often failed to see it in others or even afforded them the courtesy of seeing them, even if we can't help them. The psalmist with praise, with adoration, with worship, says, when I look at the night sky, and see the work of your fingers, God. The moon and the stars you set in place. What are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. Yet, you made us a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor and you gave them charge of everything you made. I think for all of us at the moment, there's an emotional and even a psychological exhaustion that permeates our souls, numbing our emotions and paralyzing our minds and crippling our ability at times even to be moved with compassion towards each other. It is a thing compassion fatigue and what I find is that the result is guilt-ridden inaction whether it's walking past the homeless person in the street in our city and feeling guilt and torn but I don't know what to do and should I and where am I helping or to watching the horror unfold in Myanmar and the Tigra province and parts of Mozambique as well at the moment and we stand by perhaps suffering from compassion fatigue. And in order to survive, we've refined almost to an art form our ability to turn our back and look the other way, lest we'd be overwhelmed. And I understand why I've done it myself at times. It's all just too overwhelming, from the homeless on our streets to the massacres in Tigray, Myanmar, Mozambique, the COVID deaths, the suffering. I was flying back from Melbourne, preparing to preach something different and was watching the news screen. And these thoughts started to come together, but I sat there in the lounge with tears, trying not to pay attention, draw attention to myself. But God, Sitting there watching the news reel, my thoughts turned to God, all seeing, all knowing, all loving. And I found myself wondering, how must he feel? Because I only observe, even with modern technology and news, a fragment of the pain and suffering that takes place on this planet, this glorious planet, this broken planet. He sees it all. And he watches us in our pain, in our struggle, at times in our hate and retaliation, in our selfishness and tribal smallness. But then interspersed amongst all that, moments of extraordinary acts of kindness grace, generosity, and compassion. And I thought, if I feel overwhelmed, how must he feel seeing it all? And perhaps that's why a loving, kind, merciful, compassionate God that came to center all the pain and suffering on himself. With kind of a fresh revelation 
I was drawn to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 19. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. This extraordinary picture. They're not just in the suffering and the crucifixion, the execution of Jesus. But even as he walked on the planet, God was in Christ experiencing, feeling, not just observing from the distance of heaven, but the smells, the dust, the cries, he witnessed it. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. He could no longer see our pain and suffering and I don't think this is accurate, but I'm trying to explain something. Tolerate it. I don't think he ever tolerated it, but I'm trying to find the words to express something. And so he centered it all on himself. Instead of tolerating, he took it. Jesus, in his journey, ends up in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he faces his supreme moment of trial prior to the cross, where he has to choose to drink this cup of suffering. And in his humanity, the struggle, and he says, Father, if there's any way, different way of doing this, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours. And in that moment, as he drinks that cup, He becomes the man of sorrows that Isaiah speaks of. Mark records, Mark 14, 34. Jesus' words, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Luke says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. There's this incredible picture that gets painted by Luke. He's the physician. And Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, which literally is the Garden of the Olive Press. And perhaps kneeling near or next to an old gnarled olive tree with an olive press nearby. And I've put on the screen a picture of those. But the olive press that is there uses weight and leverage. There are sacks or hessian of the day that wraps the olives in. They put a heavy stone on it. They chisel in the sandstone somewhere for the oil to run and then they can collect it. And on the beam, initially they put one weight and it's quite enormous, the pressure that thing goes on. And the best oil, the oil that would be sold for temple, for anointing, for those sorts of things. And then another stone, and it gets heavier and heavier until the final stone, the weight is so enormous, and it's now a cheap oil coming out, used for soap and around the home for cleaning and that kind of thing, that the flesh of the olive bursts through the Hessian and the Jews referred to it the olive was bleeding drops of blood and being in agony he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground there in Gethsemane the pain, the suffering, the sins of the world pressed down on Jesus with such weight, such weight of sorrow that blood squeezed out of him like the oil from a crushed olive. And I'm overcome with gratitude that unlike me, Jesus didn't turn his face away, but he turned his face towards Jerusalem to the pain, to the suffering, to the death. And he did so not only to suffer for us, but with us. 
I never tire of reading Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised. We did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrow that weighed him down. And we thought his trouble, his troubles were punishment from God, a punishment for his sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. And he was whipped so we could be healed. The Bible is filled with songs of sorrow. Over a third of the Psalms are what are called laments. And in a way I fear in modern day Christianity, and I love preaching about victory and faith, and we don't have to set those things aside and learning to overcome and finding strength in God. But I fear that we've maybe lost something in going to that. We don't know how to lament. We don't know how to deal with pain, our disappointment, our losses. But a third of the Psalms are filled with pain, lament, calling out to God. And laments turn towards God when sorrow tempts you to run from him. Laments turn you towards God when sorrow would tempt you to run from him. Laments talk to God about pain. And it actually takes faith and courage to approach God with a lament. A lament is different than crying because it's a form of prayer. It's an expression of sorrow or a venting of emotions. Laments talk to God about pain with a unique purpose to invite you back into his presence to trust again. Laments are divinely given invitations for us to pour out our fears, our frustrations and sorrows for the purpose of helping us renew our confidence in God. The book of Lamentations, which I'm sure is not your favorite, is made up of five poem, poems, each expressing profound and deep loss and grief, at times even anger. If you like, it's like reading a eulogy at a funeral these laments about loss express in mourning. And the purpose behind the book's graphic depiction of this vented sorrow, this vented pain, is to produce hope in God whose compassion is new every morning and whose faithfulness never fails. I remember my affliction and my wondering, the bitterness and the gall, Jeremiah writes. I remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So I say to myself, the Lord is my portion and therefore I will wait for him.